Good morning. My name is Valerie Massey, and I'm the Horticulture Program Assistant for the Manatee County Mobile Irrigation Lab. I go out with an irrigation tech, and we uh, evaluate people's irrigation and landscape for Manatee County residents that have an in-ground irrigation system. The focus is water conservation and to have a healthy landscape with the least amount of potable water being used. When I go on site to help people with um, their landscape and do the evaluation, the most important thing that if you want to have in your landscape is the right plant, right place. The nine Florida friendly landscape principles are all important, but the first one being the most important. And if you do that one, make sure you have the right plant for the right amount of sun or shade, that you uh, make sure that it's uh, salt tolerant. If you have a salt tolerant, uh, if you have a salt problem in your landscape due to either just the soil pH is high as alkaline soils, or if you are using uh, reclaimed water and that can contribute to that. Watering efficiently, don't want to overwater, don't want to underwater, but more efficiently the idea is that you're not overwatering. Mulch, mulch helps to um, helps to retain the moisture in the root zone and moderate the temperature in the root zone that helps the plants to be uh, healthier and survive in our especially in our summertime and keeps mulch keeps the roots warmer in the winter recycling that's recycle your um, your grass clippings uh, recycle um, even your trimmings into mulch or compost fertilize appropriately that doesn't mean that uh, that's especially important that you don't over fertilize sorry we went to the next slide ah this thing gets, doesn't like to go backwards. Okay, let's try again. Uh, fertilize appropriately. It's a time of year and the correct amount is very important that you read the label and you, whatever type of fertilization that you're doing, whether it's on your turf grass or your landscape plants, that you make sure that you're using the correct amount and the correct time of year. Not, less is, is better than more. For, your, for any fertilizations. Manage your yard waste. Uh, you wanna get out in your yard and enjoy the yard, uh, your landscape. Uh, look at your leaves of your plants to open, you know, look at the bottom of the leaf. See if you've got insects there starting in population and you can do something about that with uh, using a liquid fertilizer, I'm sorry, a, um, a soapy water just to minimize getting rid of those pests without using any heavy chemicals. Manage your stormwater one off. You want to make sure that uh, the way you're, uh, when you're irrigating, that you don't have water running off into your uh, storm drains, uh, into your ponds and things like that. Attract wildlife. Uh, you can plant certain plants that are going to uh, let you enjoy the abundance of wildlife that we have here in Florida. Some, maybe some wildlife you don't want, but uh, there's definitely some benefits. And you can help beneficials, uh, pollinators, to make sure you, whenever you select the type of plants you do to put in your yard. Protect the waterfront. Again, uh, there's a, an area around ponds that you're not supposed to be really uh, watering. You're not supposed to be uh, putting uh, plantings in that 10 foot area so that you're uh, protecting the waterfront and water the, one or the runoff into the water ponds because of the uh, fertilization. You don't want to increase the runoff into the pond. So what are the conditions for salt tolerance of a plant and how it relates to the resistance and ability to grow under those conditions? 
there are seven, there's five. High winds, um, that can leave salt deposits on leaves and that may be more um, of a problem out where the coastal saltwater deposits may be more um, in increased. What you can do about that in, in your landscape as well is for high winds is to create uh, windbreaks with sturdy, with fencing or shrubs or trees and you can help that, you can design that into your landscape. Salt spray. Um, sh choose salt tolerant plants that will recover quickly. Now sometimes uh, that's very important and you'll still see the effects. For instance, here was um, wind damage and salt damage from Hurricane uh, Irma a few years ago. And this was where out um, on Holmes Beach uh, right after this happened, uh, maybe within the week afterwards, and you can see all the damage. And again, the same kind of thing, depending on where um, certain types of palms or, or plants are located near salty water, they can be more affected than some other ones that are more salt tolerant. Alkaline soils, uh, do a soil pH test. Um, if you not sure, you should always do a soil pH test, especially if you're thinking about uh, getting ready to plant new plants or if you're having a problem. Um, in your, with some of your plants and you're not sure what the problem is. And the reason you wanna know what the soil's pH is, is you wanna know, again, right, what plant is the correct plant for your soils. But what happens with when the soil pH is too alkaline, and if you look at a pH um, scale, it's zero to 14, and the um, seven is neutral. Most plants like to be slightly acid, 6.2 to 6.5 for their soil pH. When you get above seven, you're, you're becoming alkaline soils. And a lot of our soils in um, Manti County are 7.5 and up. And after a certain point, just the um, roots cannot take up certain nutrients. And so you wanna make sure of what your soil pH is so that you're, again, selecting the right plant for the right place for your soil and for your landscape. Hey Valerie, yes. there is a question and the question says, how do I know if I have high pH or alkaline soils? Okay, so that's um, doing a pH soil test and what you can do is you can take a, you want to take, dig down about six to eight inches in your soil uh, in a particular location that you maybe think you're having trouble and put it at least a pint of soil into a Ziploc bag and you can bring it in here to the extension office in Palmetto where we're located. The Master Gardener has a plant clinic and they do a soil test, a pH soil test and that runs about, I don't know, four or five dollars, um, but you can bring it in and drop it off. We're open nine to five uh, Monday through Friday and they will do the test and then let you know when it's ready to pick up the results. Um, the As you can see here, um, when I was talking about, if you see the, the, um, the thicker line shows what's the most available in that area. So from 6.5 to 7, that is where you're seeing all of the um, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, calcium, magnesium. Those are more readily available in that pH. But when you get down into iron, for instance, and um, in that same 6.5 to 7 range, it's starting to narrow off. And as you go up to 7.5 and 8, it's really getting skinny. And what's that? What that's indicating that what first off we're getting into more alkaline soil, higher alkaline, and that nutrient is less available to the plant. And you'll see that with exoras um, and other types of plants that prefer to have a more 
um, acid soil. And you'll see where that nutrient, for instance, iron is much more readily available to the plant in between 5.5 to 5.5 to 5.5. So if you're um, have particular, if you have very alkaline soils and you have uh, exoras, for instance, it will show up usually in the way if there's an iron, it's chlorotic in the uh, leaf structure. Infertile sandy soils, which most of what we have here in Florida, um, it's very sandy, there's no really nutrients in it and, and very little moisture holding com uh, capacity. Uh, you can amend the soil, you can add compost, you can add manure, worm castings that will help to make that a more, uh, still have good drainage, but it will hold nutrients it will uh, it'll have more nutrients and it will have better moisture holding capabilities. Um, compacted soils um, and what that means is it um, it really makes it difficult for water to drain through. So when you have a rainstorm, for instance, and you notice that let's say it was a good inch or two, and you go out in your yard afterwards, maybe you've got standing water. And maybe you go out the next morning and there's still standing water. You have very compacted soils. It doesn't have anywhere to go. It's not draining. Maybe the it doesn't uh, really run towards a particular location or uh, run off because of uh, the pitch of your uh, landscape. But um, how that impacts your plants or they can't get oxygen, the water can't drain, so it creates a problem for fungus or, or and it also, uh, the, the plants really struggle to try to, um, to grow and be healthy. Valerie, there is one <clears throat> more question regarding compact soils and it says, how do I know if I have compact soils? Okay, you, what you can do, it's a very simple thing, is to just get yourself a shovel and go out where you're now. If you're if it's real wet, uh, it's going to make it easier to dig down in those soils. So that might be make it a little bit false of what you're finding. But let's say after it's dried up a little bit, you go to the an area in your yard and you dig down about six to eight inches minimum. And if you're really having like you're having difficulty and feels like you're going through concrete and you can only get down three or four inches, you're definitely <clears throat> have a problem with that. Um, we, you can see here with compacted soil, the, the actual structure is more compressed. Um, it makes it more difficult for air molecule, oxygen and or water to percolate through or to uh, get to the roots. If you, um, you can see here, two pictures, same location. The first one is of course when it was first planted for the tree. <clears throat> and then the second one is five years later and it's really almost the same size, different perspective in the, in the take the picture, how it's taken. So it looks like it's a little bit bigger on the right, maybe a little taller. But if you notice in the background, you'll see that the plant hedge along the uh, wall of the uh, building, it's uh, getting smaller. It's probably not able to get uh, air and moisture to its root zone, mostly air. The water's going to be there. It's not going to go anywhere. But it uh, Water in the root zone can be a problem for uh, root rot, uh, fungus in the turf grass areas and in the uh, area under the landscape bed plants. So again, you, this is just demonstrates how well if the plant's just struggling, it really can't thrive. So the symptoms that um, we have a problem with is uh, you have ornamentals and turf quality declines. You have less growth that uh, which we just saw in that previous slide. 
And we have unexplained or unexpected nutrient deficiencies again because the um, the uptake from the root zone uh, is a problem. More div uh, it's more more to severe drought stress. Uh, roots growing laterally, they they laterally they can uh, they can't go down. Uh, excessive thatch layer, and what that is is in the turf grass area, it builds up dead grass, or, uh, ponding of water when so so soil should drain. So that's what we were talking about before, that you have a, a rainstorm and the water just sits there and sits there and it just doesn't drain off. A lot of times when we go in and we're evaluating um, homeowners uh, landscape and irrigation, if the homes are very closely situated, built, together, maybe there's seven, maybe there's nine or 10 feet between the homes, but they each have an irrigation system and it's, a so that's fairly narrow between, and they're both irrigating and you have compact soils. That water, there may be a slight swale in between the homes, but it's just sitting there because the soil is so compact, it can't drain off and it's just a, a mess. So what we recommend to homeowners in that situation is try to get with your neighbor and agree that you're gonna cut way back on both your irrigation or alternate heads that you turn off so that you're still getting coverage. But um, it, it does make a difference. You just have to hopefully have neighbors that you can talk to. And this is showing you, it's just very compact. It's not crumbly. Uh, it's good to have a little bit of clay in your uh, soil along with sand to get a loam, as they call it, which is between, it's a combination of that um, so that it's crumbly enough, but can hold some nutrients, hold some moisture. Um, okay, when we uh, mentioned that thatch, it can be a problem with uh, compacted soils. Uh, Whereas um, if you walk around your yard and it feels kind of spongy and, or puffy, it may feel like, if you walk around and it feels like that, it could be very likely that you have an ex excess amount of thatch. Um, and that is the uh, organic matter that uh, is at just the top layer of the, uh, your turf grass. And how does that happen? Excessive uh, fertilizer and irrigation. And so you, again, you want to make sure you're using the correct kind of uh, fertilizer, putting it down at the correct time of year. Irrigation, not overwatering. Some people, I've gone to homes where they've been irrigating five days a week uh, for 45 minutes to an hour and a half on just one zone which is way, way over watering. So you kill your grass, you have this thatch buildup, it's just all kinds of problems. And it makes your mowing, the mowing uh, much more difficult. It does provide a wonderful habitat for insects and disease. And uh, it can interrupt and restrict the downward movement of pesticides and fertilizers into soil. So the question is, how do we, what do we do about de uh, getting rid of the thatch? And um, you want to consider this if your thickness exceeds one inch. And you can check that. Again, if you put down, if you plunge a shovel down in and pull it back so that you can see kind of the, what's going on at three or four inches down. <coughs> If you see an excess amount of thatch, um, and especially over one inch, it's, it's, it would be helpful to dethatch. And depending on the uh, type of grass, maybe a little bit <clears throat> on zoysia grass, you might even do it before a one inch uh, amount of buildup. And it depends on your soil conditions, your type of grass, um, as to and what methods you use to to get the best results <clears throat> there are machines <clears throat> excuse me 
that are used to do a plug aeration. We're going to get to the dethatching machines too, but um, plug aeration <clears throat> is one way to reduce uh, compaction in your landscape. What they do is the machine pulls a plug about maybe three or three to four inches long out of your uh, turf grass your soil area and it just pops it out onto your turf and with the idea that that's going to fall apart and <clears throat> it allows um, oxygen down to the roots of your uh, turf and it allows the um, uh, again some of that matter to break up and redistribute and be healthier for your lawn once you uh, and again on the dethatching the types of machines they're um, machines that do a vertical cut and they cut break it up and <clears throat> but <clears throat> depending on again that's most likely something that you might hire to have done there may be machines like that that you can uh, rent and you can of course buy them if you want to invest in that kind of machine for dethatching Top dressing, um, what that is, is if once you've done some aeration, plug aeration, then you can come back in and put down um, maybe about a half inch of good soil and rake it in to make sure you're, it's not sitting up on top of your grass. And if you do that once a year, especially with the, uh, uh, with the aeration, plug aeration, you do that two or three years in a row for a really compact soils, it's going to start to help you have a healthier turf. It'll, um, it'll help your plants. Your, uh, well, your plants are going to get help for in compact soils by adding compost and working in some good soil. If you're starting to plant new plants, you can always amend your soil a little bit. So, um, how many people have reclaimed water? Sh give me a show of hands. Okay. Uh, okay, we're going to talk about reclaimed water and uh, it, there's good benefits to it in terms of it's cheaper, much cheaper than using potable water. Reclaimed water is still potable water in the sense that or it was originally uh, potable water. It's uh, recycled, it's been cleaned, and reuse water is coming out of your lakes or ponds. The re recycled water or cleaned water is coming from their county facilities. Uh, reuse water is drawn from the lakes or ponds, but ultimately they are all coming from the aquifer. So we've got to make sure we want to conserve water, we want to be uh, as diligent as possible about and careful about how we use the water so that we're going to have healthier lawns, we're going to use less water. So this particular landscape had, uh, it had rotors out in the turf grass area that you see behind that first photo on the left. And they were watering, I think, three days a week with uh, rotors. So they, those rotors were coming into the landscape bed because of where they were situated out in the middle of the lawn. Plus, the um, you can see those brown hoses at the bottom. And that's uh, drip irrigation. And that's the kind of, if you're going to have any kind of irrigation in your landscape beds, micro-irrigation is the kind to have. However, they were also watering three days a week, I believe, and for long periods of time. So that landscape bed was getting excess amount of water and a buildup of salts that occurred on the, in the leaf. With landscape beds and plants like the Brayburnum, once they get established, their roots are out into the turf grass and they really don't need any excess irrigation, even like the micro irrigation. And because this particular landscape bed happened to be kind of out in the middle of the turf grass, it was getting watered, like I said, from uh, rotors from both sides. So um, even if the rotors had been 
correctly aimed so that they just came to the edge of the landscape edge, those roots would have still been out in the landscape into the turf grass area and they would still get plenty of water. So you don't really want your rotors onto your landscape beds anyway, but this plant, this, this poor plants, they just couldn't manage. And that's a, viburnum is a pretty tough plant. <clears throat> Reclaimed water, leaf tip burn from um, chlor chloride toxicity, too much salt. Okay, how many people, does anybody here uh, water would have a well? Can we get a show of hands there? Okay. Um, Saltwater intrusion. Okay, great. Um, and if you don't know whether you have a problem with saltwater intrusion, I know I have that problem when I live out east in the um, parish area. So it's come, it's not just near the coast, but uh, it can happen a couple of different ways. It can come sideways um, from the ocean. It can, uh, what they call an up coning that would come in a pumped well. Um, so there's one way you can also, uh, you want to know whether you're, if you're having problems with that, what you think is the leaf tip burn, it could be that you're, especially if you think they're getting enough water, uh, you might want to check that. Hey Valerie, yes, there was a question regarding saltwater intrusion. If I have a well, how do I know if I have saltwater intrusion? Okay, you, again, the master gardeners uh, here at the clinic to uh, test and you can take a water um, sample of your well water and if you get with them, they'll give you directions, or I can send you directions on how to do that uh, via email. And you take a sample, a certain amount size, and you bring it in to the clinic and they will, again, do a pH test and uh, uh, salt content if you have a problem with your well, if you think you may and you wanna know. So if anyone wants to know how to do that, to get that uh, test done, uh, just let Dina know and get an email to her and we can send that to you. As I was saying, um, the, uh, you can see here the leaf tip burn on these plants that were being welded. This person, this homeowner knew for sure that that was happening or she had had her uh, well water tested and uh, this was definitely and what she did start to do after she had these tested or had her well tested and realized that that was the problem for her herbs and some of her special plants that she really didn't want to she was just hand watering with a hose with potable water we're not we don't want to encourage the use of potable water but you know with hand watering just for special plants, that's what she was doing. So again, salt tolerance of a plant relates to resistance and ability to grow under the following conditions. We're recouping, uh, re, uh, going over here, what we were talking about before is high winds, salt spray, the alkaline or high soil pH soils, soils infertile or sandy soils, compact soils, and the salt content of, or pH of an irrigation water, which would be your reclaimed water, reuse water, um, or salt water intrusion in your well water. And if those are extreme, certain, you know, plants may be affected such that you really just can't do anything for them because you're, you've just got too many things that you can't uh, amend or change. So we wanna make sure we, select the right plant for the right place. I just want to put this slide in here to remind people, I, I had a house once where there was, we had water, we were softening for our appliances and for, because uh, it was well water and it was just really hard. And 
So we softened the water, came in so we could use it in our appliances, came in and used it for showering. But if you happen to hook up to, if that water is coming through a spigot and you're using that to water your pl plants, they do not like it. So please just be aware of that if you ever are in a situation where that uh, softened water is available to water your plants with, don't use that. Use some, use potable or reclaimed or whatever, otherwise. Lots of tools to help you in selecting plants. Um, FloridaYards.org, uh, you can go there and they give you all kinds of things that you can click on and it helps you uh, look at the Florida Friendly Plant Database, information of, about Florida Friendly Landscaping, interactive yard design, and professional corner so that you can ask questions. Um, this is the same thing we were talking about, the database, and you click on types of plants that you're looking for, whether you're in, we're in Central Florida, of course, and whether you're looking for flowers and, and just drop, goes through the menu and helps you narrow it down. Another thing that's uh, very handy that is a wonderful resource is the Florida Friendly Landscaping Guide. And you, um, it's 110 pages. If you want to order a free book or download a PDF, but the free book, they will uh, email it. Uh, I'm sorry, send it to you via regular mail, and it's free, and it's very quick. And here's the link. Also, it, it, it this just gives you a little description of what, as you go online, how to get to the location to put in your order. If you look in that book, you'll see on page 31, that's the key that tells you where we are, location, central location. It'll tell you whether a plant is native or not, what kind of water it wants, what kind of soil pH, um, whether it attracts butterflies, wildlife, birds, uh, light range. You can see here I've highlighted salt tolerant plants. What I did was I went through my book and in certain different colors, I highlighted certain things so that if I'm going back through, I can see it's easier to find what I'm looking for because I've gone through and kind of done some highlighting of certain things. So we have a lot of choices of plants, anywhere from ground covers to shrubs to trees and uh, some of them are going to be uh, more adaptable or used out in uh, West Bregnan or along the coast, but some of them are because of the zone that they do better in. Uh, we're in zone 9B and 9A if you're further east in Mantee County. Uh, out in the coast, it's going to be 10A and 10B uh, in Mantee County. Sea oxide daisy, uh, it's a nice little plant that, um, again, this is more of a coastal plant in terms of the zones. Yopin holly is um, definitely something that you see in um, yards or in landscapes. There's a couple of different versions, the more upright growth version, and then of course the weeping, um, which is really beautiful. Um, version and it can be trained to be a tree and or uh, more of a large shrub. Junipers, um, this um, particular this particular uh, yard as I would call it is what it was. They, that's all they had in their front yard was this wonderful growth of junipers. Uh, it was maybe about six feet wide and it was out near the beach, but it was, you know, they didn't have to mow anything because it was just perfect for that location. Uh, bromeliads, um, there's a large uh, range of bromeliads in terms of whether they like full sun or full shade or in somewhere in between. Um, pineapples, ball moss, Spanish moss, 
are all bromeliads are all epiphytes. Um, sour fig or I mean sour fig or hot and tot fig is also known as uh, ice plant. And uh, it's very salt tolerant and very not very little maintenance once it gets going. If if it grows uh, out a little to the pasture landscape, you just pick up the piece and turn it around and let it keep going back, and so you don't have to worry too much about keeping it maintained. Necklace pod. Um, this is a wonderful plant. Gets about I think about four to five feet tall. This is a more of a silver color um, plant that's a non-native, but it works just as well. And the native is more of a, a green, less silver, has a wonderful, you can see where the the uh, little beads that look like the, um, why they call it the necklace pod. Blue days. Um, this is a great plant, it's very salt tolerant. And even though most of the time it doesn't seem to be a problem, it really has to be a hard freeze to knock it down, but it comes back or you can just, you know, um, put it, you know, plant some more, but it's a really solid, sturdy plant. Nice color in the landscapes, not, you don't find blues as much as maybe other colors in the spectrum. Uh, lion's ear. Um, this is uh, I'd say about five to six foot in height, a real interesting shape to it and it's a good uh, plant for pollinators. Daylilies, a um, lot of variety and a lot of um, bloom time during the spring, summer, into fall. Silver buttonwood, this is a great plant and you see it out at the beach area a lot, but you see it around, I've seen it growing in parish and it's a um, some nice uh, contrast in the landscape. Black eyed Susan, they like to make sure they have, they don't want to be overwatered. Uh, beach creeper, this is something that's more meant for they say it's meant more for the beach areas, but I've seen this growing in in Bradenton just fine. And uh, sometimes people leave it uh, in growth, natural growth habit. Sometimes people, you know, put it more into a sheer sh uh, head shape. So, but it has nice little yellow berries and it's a uh, very durable plant. The blanket flower or gallardia is very salt tolerant and um, the, the liatris that's shown with this is not as salt tolerant, but these, were, these photos were taken down at the uh, Naples Botanical Park and that's fairly coastal area, so they seem to be doing pretty good there in terms of if the soil was maybe slightly alkaline. Kunti, which is um, a wonderful choice of a plant if you want to maybe three to four foot in height. A lot of times people will use this plant uh, instead of a cardboard palm, which can get, which is not really a, a palm, it's a cycad. And that can get to be eight feet tall and wide and it's just not the right uh, size for uh, certain areas and it's also the Kunti is also good to use instead of sago palms. Sago uh, palms can be uh, have a problem with uh, scale insect and uh, but it has a nice texture to it, a nice shape and it's also of course a uh, butterfly, the at Attila butterfly um, attractant or food. Uh, Crown of Thorns is a great plant, uh, has a variety of, and the, you can see on the hedge on the right is more of the dwarf size and small size on the flower. Uh, but you can, I've seen them be easily four or five feet tall uh, with the larger flower, really stunning 
different kind of uh, texture for your plants. They're very drought tolerant and salt tolerant. Uh, salt palmetto, the silver palmettos here in this, the bottom center and the right, um, really adorable plant, very salt and drought tolerant, um, a nice texture depending on what kind of landscape you're looking for. Simpson stopper, you can see the uh, trunk is very, um, has a really nice uh, visual texture bark on it. It's a slow growing plant, but uh, it's worth having. It, it offers uh, uh, berries for the wildlife for birds. Um, definitely worth, once the tree gets up, you can get the tree up to around 20, 25 feet max. They are slow growing, but they're very beautiful in the landscape um, and worth putting in the landscape. Tababuyas, um, especially uh, their bark is really wonderfully uh, textured. And of course, when they're in bloom, they're just gorgeous, very salt tolerant and drought tolerant. Cabbage palm, our, Nash, our uh, state tree, and uh, our parotis palm, they're both uh, very salt and drought tolerant. Uh, screw pines. These are very interesting. We we had a screw pine out here, had to take it down, but um, I think we still have one. But it's a wonderful looking plant. You, these were taken mostly out in the um, more towards the beach area, but definitely I see them growing uh, closer in in Mantee County. Jamaican caper. Uh, this plant is uh, wonderful. It, it really prefers more uh, part shade to shade, full shade. I've seen them growing in. And very, although this one here is growing, it looks like in full sun in the um, uh, median. It's a nice plant, uh, about probably about five to six feet tall. Bougainvillea. Um, you, this is a plant that you want to try to secure, uh, plant it so that it's not right by you, as you go to your door, especially because of the thorns. It'd be great for uh, if you want to use it to make a security fence. Um, it does need a little bit of maintenance just because you want to, you, you don't want to give it too much water. It does like lots of sun, maybe 10 hours a day. Uh, you can use it as a ground cover as well. Frangipani or plumeria is the flower that's used to make the Hawaiian lace. They're very fragrant. They are, uh, they lose their leaves and foliage for the winter. Um, and sometimes when further east, you may have to even just cover them or bring them into your garage if it's too cold. But they seem to do fine most places, especially um, close to the coast. A Geiger tree is, uh, has these beautiful orange uh, plume, uh, flowers. And this one was over in Bradenton. It's a great plant, a, a tree to be able to consider to go into your landscape. Cocoa plum, these are great plants. Uh, they can be used out on the uh, beach, but these plants here, I believe were photographed in Paris, so you can see. And it was a, a, as I remember, it was a compact soil landscape and reclaimed water. So they seem to be doing very happy there. Texas sage. This is a great plant. You don't see it. I don't see it in in the landscape as much as I'd like to. It really likes um, doesn't like fertilizer, like sandy soils. Doesn't like um, a lot of moisture. So if you want to use it in your landscape, just make sure that, you know, you pay attention to those. But I've seen it growing in um, Bradenton and in a kind of a center or central 
um, planting bed in the middle of turf grass area and it was it was rather nice it was really very healthy so they had their irrigation figured out just right for that plant southern wax myrtle um, you can see that it uh, can be it's multi-trunked tree upright and um, very healthy to have in your landscape and um, you can see the berries are good for uh, birds. It's attractant. Prickly pear cactus. Um, the pollen's attracted uh, to the bees. The fruit is edible, and um, these were taken. These this particular image on the right was taken in Bradenton. Very happy plant. Again, correct kind of moisture content in the soil. Don't want real heavy clay soils. You want to, if things like this, you might, this cactus or things that are need uh, much drier, no standing water, you would might want to mound up a little bit and plant them up a little bit higher to make sure they get, keep good drainage. Carissa, uh, or uh, you want to use the dwarf natal plum if you want to keep your plant size down to around three to four feet. There are larger sizes and that's okay and some people use them again as a security hedge or just even as part of their landscape. They do great in uh, salt. They're very salt and uh, high tolerant. Uh, salt and drought tolerant. You can see the thorns here. Uh, so the flowers um, are nice fragrance. The fruit, I believe, is edible and um, not terribly tasty, but kind of bland. Um, muley grass, um, this comes in usually in October when you see the pink plumes. And there, it's still a really pretty, um, ornamental grass when it doesn't have the plume on it you just you know it usually gets maybe trimmed back a little bit after the the bloom is gone but it's a nice um, ornamental plant to have in your landscape very drought tolerant cord grass you can see this in different locations um, by the by a pond area as well as uh, along the, in a, as a hedge Black olives, you'll see if you go, if you're down, going down Manti Avenue, you'll see a, a lot of these, what's called the cultivar called Shady Lady. Um, and uh, it's a, a nice, it does have some flower bloom. So there's a little bit of, uh, it'll be almost yellow looking when the flower in full bloom. Um, oleanders, um, beautiful plant. Yeah, I can get quite large. You can see all parts of the oleander are toxic or poisonous. So be careful if you have animals that might chew on or kids that might want to put things in their mouth. You might not want to have this in your landscape. Firecracker plant, uh, it's a nice shape. It's different. And you can see this was in a planting on a uh, landscape bed, raised bed, and it cascade. It has a growth habit of cascading over um, a wall, things like that. Live oak, um, very salt and um, drought tolerant. Granted, a lot of our yards aren't big enough for live oaks, but it's a great plant great tree, excuse me, that um, will provide lots of shade and many, many, up to, you know, hundreds, hundred or more years uh, if it's kept uh, maintained and healthy. The, uh, sometimes <clears throat> when, you know, they either get taken out when developments are done or in, but if there's, extra soils added, you know, several several inches of soil can really uh, suffocate the roots. So, and depending on the kind of, it's pretty, 
it's pretty um, flexible in the kinds of soils, but it, you really don't want to add lots of soils two, three, four inches, six inches up. You're going to, you might possibly probably kill that tree. Uh, weeping <coughs> podocarpus. Um, this is a nice size, about a six foot tall uh, weeping podocarpus. It's, I've seen it as a tree. It's quite lovely. <clears throat> Century plant, um, <clears throat> excuse me, agave. The, um, most of them, uh, once they do bloom, then they die after that. But um, again, this is something that you want to make sure of where you locate it in your landscape. You don't want it near your front door walkway so that you're getting spiked every time you go by it. As is this right here showing you. They, this was far enough just a barely away from the walkway, but it made me nervous when I went by it. Aloe vera has a beautiful um, flower spike bloom. Uh, Spanish bayonet. This is uh, quite a uh, unique plant and very salt tolerant and drought tolerant. Bald cypress, again, uh, this is a plant that you're normally going to see down by uh, water uh, ponds. Oops, sorry. Green buttonwood. This this tree is uh, very salt and drought tolerant once it's established. But um, I've known buttonwoods uh, when in severe drought, you may need to give it a little bit of water. Just put a hose at the base of the tree to make sure it doesn't get very stressed. But Generally, they're fine, especially once they're established. Um, this is what the trunk looks like over time. So it's a really wonderful texture and it's a great, great tree to have. Beach sunflower is, um, loves to have the dry feet. It doesn't want standing water. I mean, it can, take some rain, but if you have compact soils, it's, it could be a problem for that plant. It's also prefers probably further out um, west towards the beach, but um, I believe we have some growing in our master gardeners, educational garden here, and it will come back if it does get fr uh, freeze hits it. Dwarf poinciana. Uh, you want the dwarf if you have a smaller yard. Uh, you want to make sure that that will fit and not overwhelm a small space. Sea oats, uh, most of the time in the past, have been used to stabilize dunes. You can use them in your yard. Uh, Clusia or pitch apple. Uh, the large leaf shape can get up to, uh, like I said, 20 feet. I, this this uh, hedge here was at least seven feet out at the Holmes Beach uh, homeowner's landscape. It, it was beautiful. Very little maintenance needed, very salt tolerant. The leaf is very, uh, it's a fairly stiff leaf. Uh, and on the right side, you can see the smaller, it's a smaller leaf version. You can keep it more pruned and uh, five foot in height. And that's used a lot in, in landscapes. Uh, again, uh, seen it quite often in, in landscapes all over Bradenton. Sea grapes, um, this is uh, not, uh, Generally, you're going to see them um, closer to the beach, but we have sea grape here growing on our property. 
and the, uh, the you can make sea grape jelly. Railroad vine is um, it's a wonderful, fast growing, low maintenance because you don't have to do much once it gets established. And again, this is the kind of plant that as it uh, finds and grows along the ground, if it starts to get outside of its of where you want it growing, you just pick up the runner and turn it around and it will then make your um, area where it's growing thicker. Gumbo limbo, which has wonderful bark, uh, interesting bark. And um, again, they're probably more likely to be, they should be able to be grown in uh, Bradenton as well as out west on the coast. And mangroves, granted, uh, there's three types of mangroves that uh, are natives in um, grow and the first one is red mangrove is what they call reaching or the, their roots are down in the, the water then the the black mangrove which is uh, snorkeling or upright roots and then the white mangrove the man, white mangrove is used i've seen it planted in landscapes in bradenton for hedges and in it's very salt tolerant, of course. Um, it happens to have little uh, glands called nectarines at the base of the leaf on either side on the stem that help to uh, excrete uh, salt as well as to excrete sugars that uh, are uh, in of interest to insects. Um, the the black mangrove is very. They all excrete salt. And they're very high, um, highly tolerant to salt. But the black mangroves has a higher salt tolerance than the other two. The, the glands are on their leaf surface, and you can see on the upper right here, they excrete that salt. And uh, indigenous people gathered the salt, the leaves from the leaves for that, you know, use that resource. So an interesting thing about the. Uh, mangroves. Granted, we're not going to take the red mangroves or the black mangroves maybe and plant them in our landscape, but like I said, the white mangrove is definitely something that I have seen growing in a landscape in Bradenton area. Hey, thank you all and have a great rest of the day, everyone. Thank you.